the Kenya bus service was once Nairobi's transportation mainstay. Then seemingly over a couple of decades, this pre-independence bus system collapsed. If you want to access the city, it is so stressful. Now with the help of residents, experts and urban planners, we are trying to paint the effect of the downfall of a city service once envied across Africa. Even the road infrastructure that is currently there is not sufficient. And look at how it can be restored. It's evening time in the Kenyan capital and the city is in a perpetual motion. Many businesses and offices are closing shop. A majority of city dwellers are in a rush to catch transport back to their homes. It's that time of the day when the city literally comes to a standstill. Now moving through the streets of Nairobi can be hectic. The feeling of impatience never vacates. It affects your state of mind and mood, and it gets you frustrated. Oh. You get annoyed. But there is very little you can do. You are literally stuck in a stagnant car. It's now every man for himself. You can't access the city. If you want to access the city, it is so stressful. When you arrive there, you can't park. You, can, you have no walking space. If you are on foot, it's time to be extremely careful. And when need arises, just run. Your safety comes fast. After all, this is a city characterized by bad driving habits. A bad tra transport system makes the city not livable. It is not quality of life. So you find people now move towards where we have quality of life. And that is why you see uh, Upper Hill coming up, uh, people now building in areas like uh, Kilimani, Kileleshwa, Westlands. Now you see that coming out. People have moved out of the CBD because of congestion, majorly, because business is not moving. Every day, the city struggles to keep itself beating and safe. Some will say it wasn't always this bad. To understand how Nairobi's transportation took a wrong turn, you have to turn the wheel of time and go back to the days when the Kenya bus services ruled city roads. You cross, cross Nairobi and you see a sorrow state where Nairobi has become the Nairobi CBD has become a big terminus. Those days when we used to operate Kenya bus, all buses were crossing the city. Can you imagine 400 buses used to cross Kencom and there was no jam? And the same 400 buses used to crisscross through Ambassador Hotel and there was no jam. Nairobi is my second home. I wasn't born and raised up here, but I have spent half of my lifetime 
in the capital city. When I came to the city back in 2004, Kenya bus was struggling but still holding on. I had just joined Kenyatta University and I enjoyed a little bit of its cross-city services. KU was route number 45 and there were buses that will take us right inside the main campus. But a year later in 2005, the Kenya Bus Services Limited, as we knew it, collapsed. Unlike me, there are people born and raised in the capital city. Some of them have lived through the golden and troubled times of the Kenya Bus Services, or simply KBS, as it was fondly called. And I am going to look for them. This is Jericho, one of the oldest estates in the Kenyan capital. We are here to talk with city residents who have lived here long enough to see Nairobi transform. Kwa majina naitwa Safania Akonya Nandua. Ah uh, mimi ni mzaliwa wa huku Jericho. My name is Moses Kiume, uh, aka, aka Kalulu, but uh, I'm a coach. So mostly I'm known by Coach Kalulu. I'm born and raised here. Zaliwa mwaka wa elfu moja, miatisa, stini na nne. Na nimelelewa huku, tangu totoni, kufikia wakati huu. On behalf of the Queen of England. At the time of their birth, Kenya had just gained independence. They remember with nostalgia days when the city had its transportation priorities right. Our transport then was the best. Uh, we used to have Kenya bus services. I went to school in Sarai Boy Centre from class one to form four. So every morning I could commute to Sarai. In the e evening, I could come back uh, using Kenya bus services. And they had time. There was, there was, a, there, there was Kenya bus 7 in 7 a.m. in the morning. When you miss it, you'll get another one at 7.30. When you miss it, after an hour, there's another one. So our transport system then was very much organized and things were okay then. Ulikuwa unakaa kwa nyumba, Unajua tu ikifika saa tano na dakika tano, Kenya bus namba saba itapita. Kwa hivyo, siku akukua yale mambo ya kuenda kwa stage kungojea, ujui itakuja sangapi. At the time Kenya was attaining independence from the British in 1963, Kenya bus services had a fleet of 100 buses. From the beginning, it was all about speed, reliability, and efficiency. It was planned. I remember there was a bus from Jericho to, to, to Kangemi. There was a bus from Jericho to, to Kibira. You know, everything, everything okay. There was a bus from, from town to Karibangi. It could pass through from, from, from town, from Kibira, all the way to Karibangi. Haikuwa inakuacha town, tena uanze kuhangaika, inakupeleka mbaka kinyata. Tena kutoka kinyata itakuleta moja kwa moja. Na nauli pia ilikuwa ya kadri. Haikuwa kama wakati huu asubuhi unalipa shilingi miya moja, jioni unambua miya moja hamsini. Ilikuwa regulated. The buses were sufficient then as a population of 361,000 people was simply manageable. But with Kenya gaining independence, restrictions on movement were lifted. And with that, rural urban migration escalated.
by 1970s, the population growth of Nairobi had reached well over 20% per annum. The oil crisis of 1972 made transport industry difficult for KBS as the fares with no subsidy were still controlled by the Nairobi City Council who were unwilling to increase them from the 1966 levels. With the number of people on the rise, the city began to grow into new areas, creating new demand for transportation. Kenya Bus responded by increasing its fleet to 166 buses. But the demand was just too high. KBS, for the first time, could not meet the transport needs of the population. And that marked the birth of the Matatu mode of transport in the eastern parts of Nairobi and the peri-urban areas. In 1973, a group of local businessmen convinced Kenya's first president, Muse Jomo Kenyatta, to declare Matatus a legal form of transport. A meeting that took place at the president's rural home in Gatundu had resulted in an uncontrolled paratransit system. I would assume that the, the matatus were already penetrating and were becoming a very strong force. So, and those matatus, as you know, it is our elites that owned them. You know, they, they were part of, the, part of it. So it could also have been a lapsity to allow the other mode that was local to thrive. It marked the beginning of Nairobi's chaotic transport system that we see today. Now, experts say the day Kenya lost an efficient, affordable and reliable public transport system is the day it lost sanity in its capital city. So you can imagine how a non-scheduled, a non-planned, a non-structured transport service replaces a structured planned service and that's where we find our, we found ourselves we then ended up with a mode that was unstructured and scheduled but was the operating mode the matatu mode of transport neither needed any public transport license to operate nor were they required to pay any taxes to the city or central government that in effect nullified the franchise between the KBS and the Nairobi City Council and the Matatu Mode became a competitor in the city. Now they were operating uh, a, an informal service, competing a formal service, but without the same costs of operation. That is where the problem now started. To remain in the game, KBS expanded its fleet to 300 buses. That was in 1980s. At this time, the spatial growth of Nairobi had gone beyond the original city boundaries. Many had started staying in satellite towns. And so KBS started operating the peri-urban routes to the neighboring districts currently known as counties, which were previously monopolized by Matatus. The move was seen by the political establishment as an encroachment by KBS into the Matatu market. Due to the tough tussle, KBS stopped their services briefly.
mapasi au taxis hizi ndogo mwishoni In 1986, the government established Nyayo Bus Services Corporation to provide public transport in Nairobi. Nyayo buses charged much lower fares than the KBS. They could do so because they had subsidies in fuel and used labor from the state through the National Youth Service. They also imported spare parts for the buses in an environment of foreign exchange restrictions. But due to poor management, Nyayo bus services collapsed in 1992. At that time, the United Transport Overseas Services, who had owned the KBS from 1952, decided they had had enough they started to look for a buyer november 1991 they sold 75% of their shares in kbs to stagecoach holdings limited a scotland based international transport company that operated trains trams buses and ferries in the united kingdom western europe and north america In Africa, the company operated bus services in Malawi. The new owners were forced to operate in a paratransit model Kenya had adopted. While Kenya bus had designed stages and offered scheduled transport, Matatus would pick and drop passengers anywhere and inside the estates that gave matatus an unfair advantage between 1996 and 1997 stagecoach had invested more than 2 billion kenyan shillings in fleet refurbishment importing about 250 bus chassis and complete double new buses but two main factors worked against them the deregulation of the economy and the opening up of markets in 1992 made the acquisition of foreign exchange and importation of used vehicles easier than before then there was the early retirement schemes famously known as the golden handshake under the structural adjustments program it encouraged retirees to venture into the matatu business August 2000 the number of matatus operating on Nairobi roads was nearly 10000 KBS's market share had fallen from 36% in 1994 to 17% in 2000 18 seater matatus had literally taken over the dominance of public transport in Nairobi city. In 1998, Stagecoach became tired of the Kenyan market and sold its 95% shares in KBS. So when competition came, unregulated competition, it became very very difficult to operate. The beneficiary was a consortium of Kenyan investors. At this time, Stagecoach had laid off about 400 employees, mainly due to the loss of its market to the Matatus. Kenya Bus continued to face many storms and eventually collapsed in May 2005. the company's assets were auctioned to pay creditors in 2006 a new company kenya bus services management limited a brainchild of edwin mukabana was registered to start off from where kenya bus services limited had stopped the kenya bus we have right now is not the old kenya bus This was a rebranding after the old Kenya bus collapsed and it went down with the debts of uh, billions of shillings 
uh, of the Kenyans, which is a very sad affair. This is not just for Kenya bus. You've seen other big companies, Akamba, uh, the, the, the other big companies that have operated before, all of them collapsing because of unfair competition. They decided to use the famous Kenya Bus Services name, but was a different entity from the collapsed Kenya Bus Services Limited Company. It was set up by a consortium that included three of the investors who had taken over the Kenya Bus Services Limited from Stagecoach in 1998. Karanja Kabage and Samuel Gishuru were the first promoters of the original company. The other investor was Edwin Mukabana, who earlier worked for Stagecoach in Kenya and the United Kingdom. He was the company's first managing director. The new operator was forced to operate like a matatu. It stopped scheduled movements. And the result was literally a poor public transport system what is commonly called Matatu Madness, was born as Matatus remained unchecked and unregulated. You are looking at a Nairobi in future where we still do not have sufficient infrastructure, yet people have settled, you know, along the roads. So if we were to expand these roads, where are we going to build them? So we, sh we are just creating a problem which then we start sorting out and it will be much more expensive to sort out. With the city's population hitting millions and with lack of a proper mass transit system, the gradual collapse of a scheduled and efficient transport system started to bite. Traffic congestion became a problem. Many city dwellers started buying cars as Matatu's reliability remained shaky. We cannot sustain you know, our growth that way. We really have to rethink how we are going to plan. Now the government has been trying to bring back reliability and efficiency in the city's transport. Find out how it's going in our second season of the evolution of Nairobi. This is the Kenyan Historian.